to all that it is my pleasure to welcome Natalie Bo at Bill Kent, even in a virtual capacity. And uh, I first, I, I know for the, you know, and this is for the advantage of students, I want, you know, to make sure that, you know, we, he is getting a proper introduction. Um, and when I was doing a little bit of research into presenting Natalie Bowell, I was a little bit like the fellow who was writing uh, the chocolate frog cards in Harry Potter. And so I was trying, you know, to condense everything that, you know, could be said about someone like Dumbledore. So uh, what can I tell about, about Natalie Bowell? He is someone who has taught at some prestigious, extraordinary institutions, Cornell University, uh, Dartmouth, uh, Cambridge, LSE, King's College. And I'm only mentioning Ohio State and I'm mentioning only a few. Uh, he has published, and you know, I, I must tell you that I have stopped counting at 35, right? So 40-ish books and, you know, both monographs and edited volumes. He has published so many articles that I, I, have, I haven't even attempted to try counting. But when, I, when you look at his CV, you see there all the great journals in the field. Publications in international organization, international security, world politics, international studies, quarterly security studies, review of international studies, and the list goes on and on and on. But what I admire Ned for uh, is foremost because he is a first class intellect. He, is, he has a truly beautiful mind. And time and again, in this field, he was someone who has opened new avenues of research, right? And I'm going to mention just a few. I mean, he has probably the definitive work on crisis and crisis management, right? This is going to stand the test of time. He is someone who brought uh, a lot of the insights of the literature of psychology into international relations alongside Robert Jervis, one of his co-authors. Uh, he was someone who has raised uh, and, you know, raised attention about the misunderstandings concerning deterrence and deterrence failure. He was one of the first constructivists back when being a constructivist was considered to be con being controversial, right? Uh, he was, again, someone who put status on the map in international relations. And these are just some of the things that Ned Libo has done. So today I have asked him to write about, to, to, to speak to us about something that he has written about, something he is a leading authority in the world about, and this is counterfactuals. Their uses and their abuses. And I have done this in a very selfish capacity, because first I, I very much like to hear what he has to say on the subject. And second, because I have found counterfactuals to be immensely helpful in my own work. And I would like I think that, you know, uh, students here who many of them do qualitative work can benefit, you know, from hearing from, you know, uh, essentially from, from the mouth of the master. All right. So uh, with, with, uh, with all the uh, due thanks for being here, I give to you Madly Bo. I'm unmuted. Thank you so much, Tudor, for that very generous introduction. Thank you, Eliza and others, for my invitation to speak to colleagues and students at Bill Kent. Perhaps I should start with the counterfactual that in the absence of a pandemic, um, I would have come in person and had the opportunity to get to know all of you uh, in a better way than is possible over a short Zoom broadcast but this will have to wait for another opportunity in perhaps another world. Counterfactuals. In English, the simple way of referring to them is what if. What if this had or had not happened? How different would the world be? In other words, counterfactuals change some feature of the past, we call that the antecedent, and through a chain of logic, create 
a different present. So the consequence. And we all use counterfactuals uh, every day to work through decisions in our lives and to reduce anxiety. Uh, there's a big field in psychology that looks at how uh, innate it is to human beings in all cultures to use counterfactuals for these purposes. Where counterfactuals enter into social science is when we attempt any kind of causal analysis. If we say that ceteris paribus, other things being equal, that X causes Y, we're also saying that in the absence of X, we wouldn't have a Y, unless, of course, we discover multi-causation, that there are many features that can produce a Y. So to make a causal attribution, we have to somehow test for the counterfactual case. In quantitative research, uh, particularly in the sciences, there's an attempt to do this because we code on both the dependent and independent variables. Huh? So if we say that arms races are responsible for wars, we have a category of wars, we have a category of arms control, excuse me, of arms races, but we also have a category of no arms races and no wars. And we look to see how many cases fit in each of these boxes and therefore test for the counterfactual. Now, of course, that's assuming, which in IR is <laughs> a huge assumption, that these cases are independent um, and comparable, and that uh, there's only one variable that matters. Now, indeed, we can do this with multivariables, but that expands enormously geometrically the number of boxes, and it's very hard to get enough cases to fit to make a meaningful uh, determination. Qualitative researchers uh, resort to a different technique, which is process tracing. <clears throat> they say that X causes Y, and they elaborate the chain of logic that connects these two, showing evidence in support. And they may also consider a counterfactual case in which X was not present and use what evidence is available to find an outcome. Uh, another way of doing this is intracase comparisons, uh, where you look at the appearance of a phenomena on multiple occasions or of causes on multiple occasions in the same society and look to see if the consequences were the same on each occasion or what was different. So this is the way in which uh, researchers in these two traditions uh, try to come to grips with counterfactuals. They do so very differently, but they both agree that addressing the counterfactual is fundamental to making uh, any causal claim. Let me just have a sip of water. It's allergy season here. <coughs> For <coughs> Uh, one more sip, my apologies. For um, positivist uh, social science, that is the sole purpose recognized for counterfactuals. Uh, to my way of thinking, counterfactuals have functions that go far beyond the testing of propositions or theories. They fundamentally shape how we think about the world and how we formulate our propositions and theories. I mean, consider, for example, um, the balance of power and deterrence. 
they rest on counterfactual claims. The assumption in the 1940s and 50s was that if only the Western powers had stood firm and opposed Hitler early enough that World War II in Europe could have been avoided. So it was imagining this counterfactual that led to the emergence of deterrence and its acceptance as an appropriate strategy for the Cold War. And I consider another uh, uh, theory, in this case, Alexander Gershenkron's uh, notion of development. He argued <clears throat> that Britain developed as a democracy because it was the uh, first country to undergo industrialization. It could do so at a leisurely pace and in a laissez-faire way. Those countries like Germany that followed uh, were catching up and were somewhat fearful of the consequences of being left behind. So there was more state involvement in economic development. And there was more coordination between government and industry, and then between government industry and unions. Very late developers, Russia is his example, but one could also use China, were desperate to catch up for all kinds of reasons, security perhaps being the foremost. And they developed what were then called totalitarian regimes because it was necessary to do so, to industrialize at a pace that would otherwise have been unacceptable to the population. So to dream up a hypothesis like this, uh, Gershon Krohn had to ask himself, well, what would have been the difference if industrialization had begun in all these countries at the same time. It was imagining counterfactual worlds that led to the creation of a theory. If we look at why industrialism developed first in the West, to continue with our example, and not um, in China, one of the reasons that's given is that in the West, iron and coal are co-located in both uh, Britain and in that low countries, uh, Germany's uh, Ruhrgebiet, and that coal and iron deposits are close to rivers that connect to cities, so areas of major consumption. This made industrialization possible. In China, the opposite is true. Coal and iron are far apart, one in the north, the other in the south of the country. The rivers run east-west. So China developed in a very different way, given its geography. So one can then ask the question, as to the counterfactual, well, what if coal and iron were co-located in China and along the rivers? Would, industrialis would industrialization have occurred? We then have to ask a different set of questions about labor practices, all kinds of other things, to see the extent to which geography was in fact determinant of the outcome. So in formulating as well as evaluating theses, counterfactuals are central. But most importantly, and what's most neglected, and I think where social scientists feel most threatened by counterfactuals, is their possibility of taking us outside of the world in which we inhabit. So in international relations theory, realism was the dominant paradigm and still is in many ways for many people around the world for many, many decades. Liberalism in the Anglo-American world 
is the other major paradigm with uh, Marxism almost non-existent or relegated to a continental phenomenon. And now constructivism is increasingly widespread. Well, consider that World War I had ended differently. That the Axis power, the central powers that Germany won. Uh, in which case, uh, there's good reason to believe that authoritarian regimes or quasi-authoritarian regimes like Germany, uh, Russia would probably have emerged as another one, uh, with somewhat controlled capitalist economies would have offered a very different model to the Western liberal one. Uh, in which case, we'd have a different ranking of which paradigms were most important. And also consider the counterfactual, which I have at great length, that World War I was avoided altogether. In which case, realism would have been relegated to the sidelines. And liberalism and international law and uh, supranational organizations and theories about them would have become dominant. So the theories that we develop and use to understand the world are in fact a product of what has happened in the world. And if what has happened in the world is highly contingent, there's something extremely arbitrary about the theories that we use to make sense of the world counterfactuals give us the option of stepping outside of our historical framework and assessing um, what we're doing. And this, I think, may be their most important function. Um, let me stop here and entertain questions from people, and we'll have a, a good discussion from which I'll learn something as well. So uh, I'm going to do a bit of moderation right now. Um, Please do. If you who would like to ask questions, <coughs> and the first person I see is Edda Gent. Thank you. Um, my question is respect, uh, with, with respect to the relationship between theories and counterfactuals. So the last thing you said is because theories are also products of what happened in the world questioning um, events could lead to um, questioning theoretical assumptions as well. But because we are relying on, um, when we are developing counterfactuals, we are not relying on empirical cases, but um, we are imagining based on um, our own assumptions, let's say. So wouldn't it be also possible to argue that counterfactuals themselves are also open to theory, um, theoretical assumptions, theoretical uh, limitations? Oh, absolutely. Um, any view of the world we have and any theory we develop about it um, is subjective, uh, even if it is in accord with existing facts, or at least consistent to some degree with them. So here I would invoke Max Weber um, as my authority. Weber argues that there are an infinite number of ways of thinking about the world. Uh, all of them may have a high degree of validity huh? if the propositions derived from them can be evaluated. Huh? We can't say that one is better than the other, although one may prove more useful than the other, but rather they reflect very much uh, both the zeitgeist and our own position in our society. Uh, this is a fundamental uh, realization about how uh, subjective are the kinds of questions we ask and the theories we devise. Uh, Weber would also argue that we can still be rigorous in our evaluation of them. But by using counterfactuals, we're highlighting the nature of the subjectivity huh? and making ourselves aware of the fact that there is a kind of self-fulfilling nature 
to our understandings of the world. As scholars, this is something we want to minimize and can only do so in a way through counterfactual speculation. Uh, but there's another piece to your question I'd like to pick up on, if, if, if I may. And that has to do with uh, alleged differences between so-called factuals and counterfactuals. And I want to argue here that these are differences of degree, not of kind. So historians get really hot under the collar when you make an argument like this. Huh? They want to stick to the facts, uh, not recognizing that facts are themselves creations of theories and that historical claims of any kind at best can be said to be consistent with facts. So let me just give an example here. Uh, Janice Stein and I wrote uh, a book about two critical crises of the Cold War. Cold, we all lost the Cold War. And I wrote the chapters on the Cuban Missile Crisis. And one of my central concerns was why did Khrushchev put missiles in Cuba. And I came up with three arguments that he was trying to fix the strategic balance. It was a, a quick fix that he was trying to deter the Americans from invading Cuba and that he was really angry at Kennedy for having deployed missiles aha, in Turkey just across the Black Sea, and in fact, on holiday in Bulgaria on the beach, he became furious at the thought of these missiles lurking over the horizon and told Marshal Malinovsky, the defense minister on holiday with him, that he was going to get even with Kennedy uh, for this. So how do I know that this is how Khrushchev reasoned out his deployment? Well, I don't. All I can claim, and it's true of any historian trying to explain any human decision, is that it's consistent with evidence. <clears throat> he told people this at various times, but then he, like all politicians, tell people what they want to hear. So it's hard to know how much reflected his thinking or how much was an attempt to win over somebody to an initiative that he embraced for other reasons. There's never a smoking gun. Huh? There's only a story that seems to make sense because there's evidence that appears to support it. Well, the same is true for counterfactuals. There are many counterfactuals that are just as evidence rich as factuals. And we have to see them as rather than binaries or opposing forms of argumentation, as mirror images and each being co-constitutive of, of the other. And this leads to, in a way, uh, you know, a deeper set of questions about what is the difference between truth and fiction, which of course is a very timely topic. Thank you so much, Professor Rabo. Uh, the next student on my list would be Hajar Atabash. Uh, hi. Uh, you say <laughs> You say the theories are arbitrary and you are distrustful, uh, distrustful about their explanatory and predictive power. But when we when producing a counterfactual, you offer that uh, and when we offer a small change in the course of history, uh, we produce numerous alternatives in the course of history. So uh, you say that we should be consistent, and the consistency is the key in producing uh, and framing the alternatives. Uh, but uh, I wonder what consistent with what uh, do you suggest that there's a systemic process in the occurrences of events so uh, without the counterfactuals can't we observe the system 
systematic där? Um, let me see the best way of answering um, your question. Um, I, I don't necessarily argue that small changes have big effects. Uh, what I do argue is that small changes under some conditions may have big effects. Huh? And in other situations, uh, small changes have small effects or no effects. What's ever happening, they may be dampened down over time and the path of events return to just where it was before any change was introduced. So I think that um, history or any aspect of politics that you want to examine probably represents a bell curve. Huh? And that most situations are in the center. Huh? That small changes only have small effects. Huh? But as we go out toward the extremes, we come to situations where small interventions may have very large effects. One of the things um, I try uh, to do in my book, uh, Forbidden Fruit, Counterfactuals and International Relations, is to set up a, a procedure, a set of protocols for trying to tease out the answer to this question. And it's a very important question, just how contingent is something? How contingent was World War I? How contingent was Donald Trump? Um, how contingent was industrialization? Huh? Or the development of an intelligent species on planet Earth, huh? or at least a quasi-intelligent species. These are central questions to us, and they're central to our theories because we don't want our theories to rest on events that were highly contingent. To the extent to which we have theories and draw historical evidence as support, those theories are more persuasive if the events themselves were more determined than contingent. This is a, a, a fundamental question of the social world and one that cannot be explored without the introduction of counterfactuals. And one of the things that um, I, I look at, and here I credit Phil Tetlock for being the first uh, to really uh, write about this, is that a counterfactual doesn't stop with the consequent. So if I say, and I, I do believe this, that if um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand had not been assassinated in 1914 at Sarajevo, there would not have been a World War I. Uh, that is fundamentally saying that Austria would not have gone to war in, at the end of the summer in September, of August of, of 1914. But we then have to ask the follow-on question, would something else have happened? that might have produced World War I. And of course, that's the fallback argument to scholars uh, who believe that World War I was all but inevitable and who use the uh, metaphor that Europe was dry kindling awaiting a match to set it aflame. So we have to ask ourselves what else might have happened. And this inevitably involves scholars on both sides in counterfactual arguments. Thank you very much, Professor Lebeau. The next person on my list is Volkan, Volkan Imamoglu. Hello, uh, thank you for Hello. coming and uh, for your presentation. Uh, I have a question about the cases selection. Do you have in the early cases in your mind before setting up the criteria? Do you always think that World War I and the Cold War were close to what if scenario. So I'm asking whether these cases impelled you to use counterfactuals. You know, your motivation was to criticize the deterministic nature of these events in the literature. And then 
counterfactuals come up. So what, what was your first uh, initial point of your study? So um, I think that the appeal of counterfactuals and contingency to me has to do with my own early life uh, and that I was primed to think in counterfactual terms long before I started studying international politics. Um, I was the sole survivor of my family in Europe uh, during the Holocaust in World War II. And my survival depended upon a series of freakish events, uh, all of which were highly contingent and um, extraordinary uh, that allowed me to survive. So I was aware of this and asked the question, uh, well, uh, is this unique to me or is this contingency something that uh, has deeper uh, consequences uh, in, in the world. I then began studying social science and international relations in the 1950s when I started university. Uh, and the scholarship was dominated by deterministic structural theories of all kinds and theories that downplayed or altogether ignored agency, contingency, confluence, chance. Uh, I rebelled against this. Uh, it's why um, it probably explains much of my research agenda over the course of my, well, I guess I'm now in my seventh decade of, of, of scholarly activities. Um, and counterfactuals, therefore, are an important part of it. And I sought to do my best to legitimate them as a tool of study, and more importantly, to provide a foundation for us to use them in an intelligent way. That is a very interesting story, Professor Lovabo. Thank you for sharing it with us. Um, I have Yasemin uh, on my list next. Her work and in the presentation, um, counterfactuals um, provides uh, or lets the creation of the theory. And uh, different theories can criticize each other very differently, or uh, let me put it that way, uh, different scholars understand the same theory in a different perspectives. Uh, and some of these criticism can go in an extreme ways as if like realism um, does not fit the um, description of paradigm at all type of uh, criticism can emerge. Um, I would like to ask your opinion about what makes um, paradigm a paradigm, or can we um, describe or say that um, this perspective or this description of the, for example, um, re defensive realism or neoclassical realism is the correct version of the description among the literature? Sorry, it was a bit long and complex, I guess. Okay. I, I think I get the question. Thank you. So uh, what we know about a paradigm is that it encodes uh, certain substantive uh, and or theoretical assumptions about the world. So the paradigm of realism starts with the assumption that the world is largely anarchical, that states have to look after their own security, that power therefore matters and should be a first concern of states. And practically everybody in the who calls himself or herself a realist subscribes to this, but they disagree in many ways because some will uh, think about power differently than others. So take, for example, uh, a crude realist like Kenneth Waltz, 
uh, who thinks of power in purely material ways, or a more sophisticated realist like Hans Morgenthau, who's more concerned with influence than he is with power and sees material capabilities as only one component of power and power only one component of influence. Or they may disagree about just how anarchical the world is. So for Kenneth Waltz and John Mearsheimer and some other people, there is this sharp binary between domestic and international politics. For other outstanding realists like uh, John Hertz, uh, it's shades of gray. Uh, and there are regional societies uh, where some degree of norms and order um, exist. And therefore, power has to be expressed in certain ways. Uh, there are differences as well about the role of ethics. For some realists, ethics and domestic politics end at the water's edge. They have no place in international politics. Uh, Henry Kissinger is a, not only a spokesman, but a practitioner uh, of this kind of real politique. Classical realists, Hans Morgenthau among them, or me, argue that ethics is absolutely central uh, to the practice of foreign policy. I have a book that's just come out two weeks ago with Cambridge University Press called Ethics and International Relations, A Tragic Perspective. It differs as far as I know from all other books on ethics because they tell you or political actors how they should behave. I don't. Rather, I argue, I make an instrumental argument for ethics. I try to demonstrate through the use of uh, data set and case studies that foreign policies in accord with conventionally accepted ethical norms are more likely to succeed and those that violate them less likely to succeed. So that's a very different kind of argument, but one that's within the realist tradition. There's no right or wrong here. People make different bets about the world. Continue with realism. For some realists, they're interested in what um, the Greeks called phronesis, or practical knowledge. And Hans Morgenthal and John Hertz uh, would very much fit in this, in this category. That the purpose of our theories is to help us understand and cope better with the world in practice. At the other end are people interested in episteme, uh, scientific theory that can be expressed even in mathematical terms. There are a lot of realists of this kind who are more interested in theory than in practice or think somehow that theory can in a one-to-one -one way uh, inform practice. This is a, a profound epistemological difference that takes place within the realist paradigm. So paradigms of any kind are loose formulations that people are allowed to formulate in any way that they think is reasonable for the purposes to which they're using it. Now we come with the question of how we understand theories or terms within these paradigms and do we think, and this is the heart of your question, that there can be any agreement about them. Um, here I want to invoke uh, Nietzsche who argued that uh, the only concepts about which we can have any clarity are those that have no history. In effect, a concept like power or the state or certainly the balance of power have been used in a myriad of different ways by people over time. This has happened because people are using them to advance particular political or intellectual projects. There's no way we could get everybody to agree to apply them in the same way. It just doesn't happen. And it's a mistake, and a mistake really made only by crude positivists to think that we could have 
uh, absolute clarity about our concepts. And this brings me to another point, if I can take another minute or two to answer this, this interesting question. Um, let's think about the difference between the balance of power and temperature. We can all agree about temperature, right? We have Celsius, Fahrenheit, Kelvin, these are different scales, but they're all readily translatable one into um, the other. And the reason for it is that they're all measuring the same thing. And that same thing is something real, the energy level of molecules. The more energetic molecules are, the more active they are, and the more whatever they, wherever they are, the more it expands. And one of the reasons we use mercury in our thermometers is that it tends to expand and contract a lot at room temperature. But it's the energy level of molecules that's making this happen. And presumably, if they were physicists on Alpha Centauri, huh, whatever scales they had would be readily translatable into ours. And the only differences would be attributable to experimental error. Come to the balance of power. What is a balance? Well, there are different notions of what a balance is. Even Hans Morgenthau uses it in three different ways in politics among nations. It's a balance where the scales are even, or it's a preponderance of power in favor of either status quo powers or so-called imperialist powers, or it's simply the distribution of power among leading states. What's power? Well, power people frame as having different components. Oh, size of a country, population, economy, military, quality of leadership. Um, all of these are subjective things and each of those has multiple components. And if you unpack those components, they have components, it's ideas all the way down. Never do you get to anything real like the energy level of molecules. For this reason, there can't possibly be any consensus about what power is because it's a total reification. This is true of just about every concept in the social sciences from anxiety to development to even what war is. So we have to learn to live with this. Thank you very much, Professor Lebeau. My next, uh, the next uh, question will come from Lachin. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for the lecture. Um, my question is that you put a great emphasis on how theories and facts are actually, so, actually a social construction. And um, you suggest that strength of a counterfactual lies in its plausibility. But plausibility hinges on our assumptions as well, based on our prior beliefs. So it seems very subjective and hermeneutical. And I want to ask, how do we generate more recognition for our arguments when we engage with counterfactuals? Or how do we come up with well-rounded arguments? This, this, is a, this is a very good question. And I only have partial answers to it, but let me go back a step. Not every counterfactual has to be realistic. Let's distinguish, as I should have in my introductory talk, between two types of counterfactuals. One is what Max Weber called a minimal <clears throat> rewrite counterfactual. It changes uh, something uh, small and simple and it, it does so in a way that seems very credible. So if we come back to our famous Archduke Franz Ferdinand um, example, uh, it's crazy that he was assassinated. He should never have been in Sarajevo when threats of assassination had come through, and especially on a day that was a Serbian uh, 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 
day commemorating, uh, here we come back to Turkey, defeat by the Turks. Huh? So it was uh, provoking the Serbs uh, unnecessarily. And after the first failed assassination attempt, any security detail uh, should have whisked them out of town immediately. They didn't. Huh? So doing away with the assassination is actually making the world appear more realistic uh, than it was. So hence it has a certain credibility. This is the hallmark of minimal rewrite counterfactuals. They, they have to be very defensible, very feasible in the eyes, not only of you, but to the people to whom you're trying to uh, persuade that this could have happened. Then we have, uh, and here again, I credit Phil Tetlock for the term, uh, miracle world counterfactuals, things that couldn't have happened. Earlier, I used the uh, example of, uh, of coal and iron in China. Well, there's no way in a real world that we can have them co-located. We can only do that in our mind. But it's perfectly reasonable to have a miracle counterfactual for purposes of constructing a theory and then deriving propositions which we might evaluate against real world evidence. So both kinds of counterfactuals have, have their place. Now, uh, in evaluating minimal rewrite counterfactuals, they have to meet um, a set of conditions. And here, Phil Tetlock and I disagree. So let me take a few minutes and elaborate this and uh, you'll see the two sides of the argument. Um, we both agree that they have to be consistent with what evidence is available. And we both agree that your chain of logic that connects the antecedent to the consequent can't be undercut or severed by something else that arises from the counterfactual. Let me give you a case in point. Um, Khrushchev put missiles in crisis in Cuba that provoked the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, Kennedy had tried to remove Castro from power in 1961 at the Bay of Pigs invasion, which failed. And it failed because it was poorly conceived, because Castro was popularly supported, and because Kennedy would not commit American forces to invade Cuba to overthrow Castro. The counterfactual is that if Richard Nixon had been president, and it was only hanky-panky in Illinois that gave the Democrats uh, an edge, that he would have certainly authorized the use of force, that Castro would have been overthrown, that there would have been no communist Cuba receptive to Soviet missiles, and hence no missile crisis. So uh, one can ask um, what's wrong with this counterfactual. And as you um, think it through, um, excuse me, I set it up the wrong way, my apologies. It's if Richard Nixon had been president instead of Kennedy, that he would have authorized, uh, my fault, he would have authorized the airstrike and invasion, and this would have led to war between the Soviet Union and the United States, rather than a peaceful resolution of the crisis. But in fact, if Richard Nixon had been president, he would have authorized the invasion of Cuba, and there would have been no Cuban Missile Crisis. So one has to trace through with counterfactuals, not only the chain of logic between your antecedent and your consequent, but other things that might happen. Now, where Phil and I disagree is he thinks, and many positivists do, and Phil is a positivist, that we should only, uh, we're only allowed to use counterfactuals that are consistent with well-established theories. But in social science, there are no well-established theories. Uh, so that kind of limitation that 
positivists are very keen to impose on counterfactuals and therefore provide scientific justifications for their use. This leaves us in a kind of uh, a subjective world where uh, there are no foundations for anything, whether it's ethics or science. What we have are protocols of what makes good science and good research. But these protocols are not derived from logic as the Vienna Circle tried. Rather, they reflect the understandings of good scientists or good social scientists about what good practice is at any given moment. And these protocols evolve over time. They're challenged. New ways of thinking come up. And what was in the past unacceptable becomes acceptable now, or what was acceptable in the present becomes unacceptable in the future. For all kinds of reasons, there is a give and take process between our use of arguments, whether they're factual or counterfactual, and our understanding of the protocols used to evaluate them. This is a constantly evolving uh, game. To the extent that this is true, ultimately arguments rest not on a logical or empirical base, although that must be present, they rest on their ability to persuade others. And persuasion, in turn, uh, rests on highly subjective criteria. So there, the attempt to try to provide foundations is an attempt to ignore uh, all of the subjective aspects of this process and ironically to make that process that much more subjective. That's my radical response. Thank you very much, Professor Lebeau. The next student on my list is uh, Mehmet. Professor, thank you for the illuminating speech. And the, the counterfactuals thing sounds like a daily practice we do without realizing it. But after I read the, uh, the criteria, the nine criteria you provided, and I also have seen the similar one in Jack Lewis' piece, it, it more sounds like, it, more, I mean, it seems like an exhausting uh, practice to do. So is it, does it really worth to go, go after counterfactuals and stay away from the real world? Well, don't you think when you do research uh, of the so-called factual kind, that you're involved in a similar set of protocols that make it just as difficult and as tedious to, to make a causal claim? Is there any difference? What do you think? I don't think that there is any difference, but... So there you go. <laughs> it's just that research is difficult. <laughs> so on, on, on that note, maybe we should uh, get another difficult question from another student. Uh, how about Astrid? Um, thank you for Professor, Professor Lebov. Um, my question is how far in the, past, in the past do you have to go to come up with a useful counterfactual or to ask in another way, um, is it, to what extent is it possible to link counterfactuals to current affairs? Um, you already mentioned if it were not for Corona, you would be in Ankara with us. Um, we can also ask what would have happened if uh, the World Health Organization would not have declared um, Corona a pandemic, what would have happened? Is that a useful frame for counterfactuals? Oh, um, I, I think so. Let's take your excellent example of the coronavirus. Hmm? Um, by using counterfactuals, we could ask ourselves, are there feasible things that could have been done to have made this pandemic 
much less severe or indeed to have prevented a pandemic altogether. And if we can answer this in a convincing way, then we can place more responsibility on those who failed to take these actions that led to the world that we now live in. So case in point, we can start right away in China. Uh, my first counterfactual would be if the authorities in Wuhan had not tried to cover up that there was a disease that was spreading and had reported it to central authorities in China, the Chinese government would have stepped in much earlier. And different things uh, would have happened. The infections might have been uh, contained uh, locally. Uh, secondly, look at the way in which uh, Britain and the United States have responded uh, for different and some of the same reasons. Uh, those countries have much higher infection and death rates than other countries in the West. This is attributable to their policies or lack of policies in responding. Um, and here, we don't have to have a counterfactual. We can use comparative analysis. My wife is a New Zealander. She's very proud of how her country has responded to the coronavirus. We have a range of responses carried out by different developed countries that have given us, as a result, a different range of infection and death rates. So for this kind of analysis, we can actually use so-called factual analysis to make our comparisons. By using factual and counterfactual analysis, we come up with a good understanding of why the coronavirus has spread the way it has, and we can use that understanding to generate lessons that can be very useful the next time around. In fact, uh, this is precisely what the Obama administration had the Center for Disease Control do um, in the aftermath of a prior flu epidemic. It came up with a series of procedures and practices, uh, none of which were implemented by the Trump administration that went into a serious denial um, instead. So we can use factuals and counterfactuals to assess and evaluate policy, but also to evaluate and make suggestions for the kinds of policies that will work. And here, let me end with um, uh, coming to epidemiology. Uh, so epidemiologists have developed uh, a fairly robust equation for the spread of disease. It has multiple terms in it. And one of the things they routinely do when they face a new disease or an outbreak is they uh, run this equation both factually and counterfactually. So they can't change the mortality rate or the infect infection rate of a particular pathogen, but they can change counterfactually and convincingly how people respond. And for example, when they looked at HIV, um, they discovered that one of the key variables uh, had to do with uh, needles. If they did away with multiple use of needles, not only by addicts, but in hospitals and medicine more generally, they could significantly reduce the spread of disease. And they learned this through counterfactual manipulation in a computer of their standard equation for the spread of disease. So this is a process that's already deeply embedded in science and very relevant for the study of policy. Thank you so much, Professor Lebo. The next student I have on my list is Stepan. Uh, 
Uh, Professor Lebov, thank you very much for the speech you gave in the beginning of our session. I would like to ask you uh, such a question. So uh, please correct me if I have a wrong impression from uh, your analysis. So uh, it seems that no event is actually determinate, that uh, there, there are no um, inevitable outcomes uh, in any historical event, for example, which we analyzed. And in your uh, in your book, you also emphasize that there should be a balance between structural uh, reasons, structure and uh, actors. Uh, for example, there was, um, in, in your analysis of the First World War, uh, you described that uh, First World War was, was not inevitable, that uh, through actors actually interacting with each other, it, uh, it could be escaped and never uh, appear. So uh, although you emphasize that there should be a balance between actor and structure, uh, it seemed to me that uh, you, uh, you more give emphasis to actors. So please, could you elaborate a little bit about yes. actor-structure relations? So you, you really asked two questions. The, the first is the extent to which any event is overdetermined as opposed to being contingent. And I do believe there are events that are overdetermined. So it seems to me that sooner or later, settled communities would replace nomadic tribal groups. Uh, although my friend and former graduate student, uh, colleague Jim Scott, has written a wonderful book about this called Against the Grain. Uh, and the, this being, of course, a pun on, uh, on settled agriculture, uh, arguing that, uh, in fact, the nomadic lifestyle was healthier and produced happier people, that people had to be forced uh, to settle down and live in larger settlements. And once they did, uh, died off uh, more rapidly and had much worse uh, physical conditions and health for the period in which they, they were alive. But I do think it's inevitable that, that this happened. I also think it's inevitable that uh, we ultimately had an industrial revolution. Uh, there are various other things that are inevitable, but it um, doesn't mean that they had to happen when they did, that they had to take the form um, that they did or have some of the consequences that they did. To me, one of the most interesting questions is not deciding whether something is completely contingent or completely determined, but rather understanding that most of the world is both. And therefore trying to tease out the conditions uh, that allow some variation. What kind of variation can occur and under what conditions and what are its implications. Uh, this involves both so-called factual and counterfactual um, argumentation. And of course, it gives agency um, a certain role. But agency is not the only source of contingency. Uh, take, for, for example, the failure of the Mongols to conquer Japan. Uh, it's attributable to typhoons. Uh, something over which human beings had had no control. Uh, so too are various other uh, geographical and non-human causes, uh, pathogens, uh, absolutely central uh, to the history um, of humankind. Uh, when we come to agency, the issue here, as, uh, as you well know, is uh, how much, oh, excuse me for interrupting, the recycling truck is just pulling up in front of our farmhouse here, and it wasn't here last week, and I'm very happy to see it collected because my recycling bin is absolutely overflowing. This is, this is a good thing to happen today. We live, um, I'll take a, it, uh, at the, um, we're almost uh, off the grid. Huh? We're on the, the slope of, uh, of, of Moose Mountain. Uh, 
which is uh, about uh, a little over 1,500 meters. We have our own well. Uh, we have a leach field for sewerage. Uh, we have a generator in the basement if the power goes off and the power is the only way we're connected to the outer grid. So it really, in a highly developed world, is at the edge of that developed uh, community. But by having all of these things, I try to make our life here less contingent. But c coming back to your question, so uh, again, Max Weber argued that all political behavior is the conduct of human beings. So everything is, is agency. But Weber also recognized, uh, as did Marx, that human beings, the kinds of choices they make, the goals they pursue, the means they think appropriate to achieving them are very often socially determined. And that there's an obvious interplay between society and people, because if there wasn't, there would be no change. Change always comes at the individual level, and it may then be enter the social level and influence other people. And sometimes this agency change is stealthy, sometimes it's dramatic. I'm going to give you the two examples. So when <clears throat> I started university and in the 50s, uh, we all wore uh, jackets and ties and hats to class. Uh, we all opened doors for women. Um, these practices have long since ceased. Uh, you can't attribute it to any particular movement or any particular agent, over time, individuals decided not to do this to such an extent that if you open the door for a woman at an American university today, she would probably look at you askance uh, and view it as a form of sexism. So this has been a stealthy change produced by agency without the intervention of institutions, of government, of law courts. But compare that to the phenomenal growth in the acceptance of homosexuality in the last decade. Huh? This was observed, debated. Uh, it involved uh, not only individual practice, but law courts, uh, governments, institutions, uh, these are two very different kinds of change, but in both they're instituted initially at an individual level, and then the changes at the social level affect individual behavior, and in some cases they're fiercely resisted, as is, let's say, uh, uh, gay marriage by the Republican Party in the United States. And one of the reasons evangelicals support Donald Trump is his willingness to appoint judges who uphold very traditional understandings of morality across the board, not only pertaining to sexual practice. So they become great matters of political contention. Uh, all we can say is that we can track these things and we can try to look at um, the relationship, but to argue that one or the other is foundational in the state. They're, they're, they're co-constitutive and they work in different ways in different circumstances. Uh, there are no rules that apply across the board, which in fact makes the study of politics very much more interesting. Thank you very much, Professor Lebeau. We have um, Sevde next and then two other students who have already asked their questions, they would like to come up, uh, they would like to come with new questions, but for the time being, I'm gonna ask Sente. Thank you, Ujam, and thank you, Professor Debo, for uh, meeting with us today. So mine is going to be more of a uh, thinking out loud uh, kind of question. 
So I just wonder what you think about uh, what I'm going to say next. So while reading uh, the book, I realized that uh, the counterfactual, I mean, you mentioned that it is also very important for decision makers and decision making processes, uh, counterfactual thinking. So, uh, so while reading, I mean, I, uh, I remember the uh, domino theory understanding and the US involvement in Vietnam War. So I just, I, mean, I thought that, uh, because, I mean, it seems that although their uh, motives are not clear, it seems that um, the counterfactual uh, assumptions and counterfactual thinking, the alternative world, seems to have a big influence in US involvement in the world, even though it has to, it is true or not. So uh, when we think of it this way, I mean, can we say that, I mean, do you find it uh, dangerous uh, in the sense that the counterfactuals can enable uh, states for dangerous or problematic ventures, or is it already embedded in such processes? No, well, I think you, 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 you're absolutely right in your comment, uh, and it clearly works in, in both directions. So uh, think about the deterrence counterfactual, and I argue at length, and I won't bore you with my argument because you probably know it already, that the Munich counterfactual has had a terrible effect on international relations. It's also, by the way, based on bad history. And it wasn't until it was well established that anybody really asked the question, uh, what if the West had stood firm at Munich? And we now know from all the uh, German documents that Hitler wanted war. He was furious with Chamberlain for giving in at Munich. Um, so the lessons based on bad history, but it was applied with a vengeance and then confirmed tautologically. So even when deterrence provoked the kinds of conflicts it was designed to prevent, people didn't come to that conclusion. Rather, they came to believe that deterrence hadn't been practiced strongly enough. Huh? So uh, this has been disastrous. On the other hand, um, if you think about um, counterfactuals also related to World War II, let's say what enabled Hitler to come to power and do what he did initially in Germany, uh, the counterfactual of avoiding Hitler and doing things differently and learning from what might have happened in Weimar has been central to the Federal Republic of Germany, where it has had very positive consequences in bringing about democratization, in encouraging Vergangenheitsbewältigung, uh, coming to terms with the past. So the counterfactuals um, have all kinds of consequences. There's good psychological research, this will be relevant, to all of you as, as students. <laughs> There's good counterfactual uh, 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 research on how students respond to have, having done badly on examinations. Not that this has ever happened to any of you because you're clearly all very bright students. And one of the defensive responses invokes counterfactuals and says, well, I didn't do, I didn't do well because I really didn't study and prepare for the exam. Had I done so, counterfactual, I would have done well. This can provide motivation for students to study. And studies suggest that when you take students and put them into control and experimental groups and get them to confront the question of why they did badly on an exam, those who come up with the counterfactual I could have studied will do better on the next exam than the control group who hasn't. Huh? So it can be very motivating. Um, on the other hand, you can readily see circumstances where counterfactuals are offered as an excuse to reduce your um, responsibility. For example, um, George Bush and his administration were in some ways responsible for not preventing the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. There was all kinds of evidence that Al-Qaeda had the World Trade Center as a target. 
But psychologists tell us that when dramatic catastrophic events happen, that one of the ways in which we reassure ourselves and overcome anxiety is by convincing ourselves that they had to occur, that there was little we could do to prevent them. Well, if there's an accident and you're a driver, you might undergo this kind of argument. And this therefore had very good political consequences from the perspective of George Bush. So counterfactuals can motivate people to act in positive ways, but at the same time, they can lead us uh, to deny the kinds of choices that we had and have to deal with threatening situations. Uh, and all of this varies on the context and the person. Thank you very much, Professor Lebeau. Um, the next person I have on my list is Yasemin. Um, it's me once again. Uh, yes. so Professor Hello, my, yeah. <laughs> um, second question is about the uh, turning points. Uh, how can we uh, know that whether an action or an event is the actual turning point, but not the uh, presented point? Uh, and can we have more than one turning points for the same uh, event at the same time? So a turning point is, of course, a uh, well, let's go back a step. All right. Uh, there are uh, realists, and this is with a small r, philosophical realists, not uh, IR realist, who believe that cause is the cement of the universe, that the universe, for whatever reason, is organized in causal terms. Um, there are others, starting with David Hume, and I count myself among them, who believe that cause is a human artifact. It's a, a device that we use to try to make sense of the world. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't at all. If you try to apply cause to quantum mechanics, you'd go crazy because you know effects happen before causes. There are things that are non-causal, just very different. So if you accept the fact that it's uh, a cognitive shorthand that's very useful in many circumstances, then the whole notion of a turning point is yet an, another uh, artificial device, which may or may not be useful depending on the situation. Uh, there may well be tipping points as there are in physical phenomena. Some of you may be familiar with the experiments uh, done initially by Pear back in Denmark in the 1970s on sand hills. So he dropped one grain of sand at a time on a table from a device that was stable. So the grain of sand always fell in the same place at the same speed. And he looked at what happened. And gradually a hill would build up. And then at some point, the next grain of sand would cause a cascade and a collapse. But this varied over time with wide variation in how many grains of sand you needed to have a collapse or in what direction the sand hill collapsed. So it became impossible in this case to find tipping points. And much of the world is like this. In other situations, we can have tipping points with some precision. So if we observe the transition of water into either gas or ice, huh? we have a tipping point and we know at exactly what temperatures and pressures those tipping points come. And this is extremely useful for our analysis in every way. In the social world, once again, I suspect that there's a kind of bell curve distribution. Somewhere between Pearback's Sandhill <laughs> and the phase transition of water anchoring each end of the continuum. By our analysis, factual and counterfactual, we have some hope of trying to understand where these tipping points may be. It's also true that with many phenomena, there may be multiple tipping points. 
So something like death is equifinal. Huh? If you remove uh, heart attacks as a cause of death or infectious diseases, you only make it likely that people die of other things. And if you manage to control those, well, then people will die of still other things. It's, it, it's going to happen. And the analogy is also good because we don't really have a tipping point. So what happens is uh, uh, doctors and physiologists say from about the age of 24, we begin the aging process and a decline. And it's very slow. It only is when you get to my age, it increases quite, quite rapidly. Uh, there's no tipping point. There's just a gradual process. And anywhere along this decline, depending on context, something could happen to produce mortality. So it's a different way of framing it. So some circumstances we can use tipping points, in others we can't, and in those where tipping points are useful, we don't necessarily know where, we, where they are, as with the sand pile. I think that's true, for example, when we look at environment. We know that we're heading to catastrophe. Uh, planet death, uh, if you like. Uh, we know that this is a gradual process, we look at how temperature is rising across the world. We look at how uh, weather phenomena are becoming more extreme of all kinds. We know things are getting worse. There may be tipping points. We don't know. My oldest son, some, oh, I think 25 years ago, was involved in a study of the Gulf Stream and did the math. He's a mathematician for a group of um, uh, marine scientists. Uh, and they discovered in their models, and other people have taken up on this now, and there's more evidence for it, that at a certain point, uh, the Gulf Stream reverses its course as a function of global warming. That rather, it now it flows along the Atlantic coasts, uh, offshore of the United States and Canada, flows across to Europe, and then is subducted into the ocean because it's lost most of its heat, returns as cold water to the Caribbean, where the process begins again. And the tipping point is that the Gulf Stream will go as far north as Newfoundland or Labrador, and then be subducted and return. If that happens, climate models show within 100 years, Europe is covered by glaciers. So that's a tipping point phenomenon that could have uh, phenomenally rapid and catastrophic consequences. And we have to be very careful about uh, applying tipping points or gradual change with contextual factors coming in uh, depending upon the situations we're examining. We can often make arguments for both. Think of politics. So take the collapse, for example, of the German Democratic Republic. There was clearly a gradual process underway of loss of faith of people in the regime for many, many reasons. But it required a tipping point. And that tipping point, we now know, and Mary Serrati has written a very good book about this, were the German, East German tourists who had sought, who had holidayed in Hungary, neighboring country and in Austria, in Hungary, and had um, sought to leave and seek refuge in Austria. The East German government said, no, you have to come back but we'll let you return to Germany, we'll issue you new passports as undesirables, and then you can go west. So the trains with these tourists traveled across East Germany, and people came out everywhere to wave 
and cheer the fellow East Germans who were going to leave. Suddenly they looked around and recognized that everybody else hated the regime too. Something they didn't know beforehand because the Stasi was so effective at keeping people atomized and so fearful of expressing opinion. So overnight, there was a, a sea change, a sense of solidarity, demonstrations, and all the rest became history. So that was a tipping point. But it's not one we could have predicted in advance, is it? Only in retrospect, it became apparent. Hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. The next question is from Mehmet again. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Libo, if we hadn't had the coronavirus, we still might end up uh, with this Zoom meeting uh, because of uh, due to some other uh, circumstances. We still would have ended up with what? With, with this Zoom meeting. So we we might end up with not not a face-to-face. Uh, -face, um, oh, face -to -face. a distant meeting. I, I got you now. Sorry. Go ahead. As you re, as as you call it, as a second order uh, counterfactual. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Make the argument for. <laughs> well, could you please more elaborate more on the counter uh, second order counterfactuals? Because I don't get it. How can we utilize it in our research exactly? Ah, so uh, so with the second order counterfactual, we've introduced a change, a, a consequent through our counterfactual. We then have to ask, well, um, would the change we have introduced uh, continue to um, bring history or developments down a very different pathway than actually happened? Or would other events have sort of brought them back? So let's, let's use an historical example here, and then we'll talk about how we could do this. Uh, the Spanish Armada, 1588. Uh, defeated uh, initially uh, off the coast of England, but even more so in the Dutch harbors uh, where it sought refuge and the remnant then tried to sail around England to go back to Spain, it was destroyed in storms. Let's suppose the, uh, the Spanish had had uh, the troops in the Netherlands ready to embark on the barges to take them across to England and that the weather had been uh, uh, accommodating. In all likelihood, the Spanish would have conquered England because the English didn't have forces to oppose this very professional and large army. Um, however, uh, historians like Geoffrey Parker argue that the Spanish conquest of England would have been short-lived because it was uh, uh, an extension of Spanish power beyond which uh, it could be sustained, that Philip III, who replaced Philip II, was not really an effective ruler of any kind, that the Spanish were facing, or would have been facing more acute financial restraints. So ultimately, within 30 or 50 years, the Spanish would have been expelled, Protestantism would have returned to the throne in England, and uh, not all that much um, would have changed. So that's a second counterfactual, second level counterfactual argument. And what we do when we try to make second counterfactual arguments is we ask the first question, are there minimal rewrites that would bring history back on track? because we obviously want to do so with minimal and most realistic of change. How many of them are there? Huh? So the more minimal rewrites we have that might push things back to where they were before, the more likely it is to happen. The more we have to go to deeper and deeper levels of analysis and further back in history for changes to bring it the path back to where it was going, then we could argue the more determinate these changes are. And of course, like all history, it becomes a question of writing convincing arguments that persuade other people. 
I mean, there's no silver bullet here. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we have two, uh, two more people at, two, at this point. Um, if any of you want to ask a question, please raise your hands. But on my list, I have Volkan and Hajer. That's uh, fine. We'll take, why don't we just take the two more for the moment? Okay, so um, Volkan, would you like to go? Would you like to ask your question? Sure, thank you. Hello again. Um, you'll talk about the what if Nixon was elected as president in the 19... 60 elections instead of Kennedy. So I'm asking how can we sure about Nixon's use of force against Cuba so that Cuban Missile Crisis never happened? Right. Or you are just only talking about the possibility of his use of for him using force? Do you think there is a possible also possible that he would do the same thing as Kennedy? I know you have emphasis on Nixon's personality being hawkish, but what do you think? Can we have the same results with different personalities? So, so here's a question. This is a very good question because we have historical evidence. Nixon said he would have used force. Uh, he pushed for force to be used against Cuba consistently. Um, he almost certainly, I think, given his record and stated views and inclination, would have gone on with the unanimous recommendations of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to uh, follow up with an invasion of Cuba. It took somebody of enormous courage uh, to say no. Uh, so Kennedy was the exception and Nixon closer to the norm. So another question now rises. Uh, what if Nixon is talking about after the results? You know, maybe he was in the position, maybe he wouldn't do, he would do the same. So he well, was- we know that, Well, but we know that when he was vice president, he was urging the use of force against Cuba. Mm. So we have evidence from when he was in power and privately advising the president, and when he was out of power addressing this very same situation. I mean, a more interesting case. So um, consider the contested election of Gore and George Bush. Well, so George Bush, we know, uh, invaded Iraq with consequences that are still rippling through the Middle East, and most of them not good. What about Al Gore? Um, I've made an argument that Gore would not have invaded Iraq. Uh, in fact, there was no strategic, uh, economic, or any other powerful argument for uh, invading Iraq the Secretary of State, Bush's Secretary of State, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, um, I'm trying to think of it, uh, his name now, the former chief of the military, now is at City College in New York, Colin Powell. Oh, forgive me, I had a memory lapse. Colin Powell advised George Bush at his election that we have Saddam Hussein in a box. We have him just where we want him. He's powerless. Huh? So presumably, uh, Gore would have behaved differently and we'd live in a very different world. And the outcome of that election was highly contingent because it was determined by a Republican cheating at the ballot boxes and disallowing so-called hanging chads from, from ballots. But my former student, Frank Harvey, and now a professor at Dalhousie in uh, Canada, has written a book arguing that Al Gore would have attacked Iraq as well. Huh? So making the argument in a way that you've made about Nixon at the Bay of Pigs. Uh, and again, we don't have a definitive answer about this. The most we can do is have a reasonable debate. And in some cases, one side or the other seems to have the better argument because there's more evidence that supports it. Yeah. And the Harvey book, even though it disagrees with me, it's a wonderful book. I recommend it. I've given a blurb uh, to, the, to the dust jacket because uh, we need reasoned arguments on both sides of all issues. Okay. Thank you so much. And the next person would be Hajir. Thank you. 
Uh, you have already elaborated on the agent and structure perspectives, but what I'm going to ask is actually close to what Volkan has just asked. But uh, I figured out from your book that you have an agent-based approach since uh, rewriting starts with the change of an act actor, actually. And uh, you argued that the, if the Arch Archduke Franz Ferdinand wasn't, uh, hadn't been assassinated, the uh, Austrian Prime Minister Bert Berchtold or Konrad von Hetzendorf couldn't have been effective on the uh, Austria-Hungary's politics to lead it, in, uh, lead it into war against Serbia. But um, this, uh, I already got the sense of a raison d'etre from for the war here. But uh, following up on your counterfactual, and um, if he hadn't been assassinated, wouldn't he be ever under the so, same social and political constraints that uh, Conrad and Berchtold was under? Well, so let me answer that question, but use it as a vehicle to the broader question about the extent to which my arguments are embedded in agents. Okay, so um, uh, Franz Ferdinand, uh, in contrast to uh, Berchtold and um, uh, Conrad von Hitzendorf uh, believed that any war between Austria and Russia was likely to lead to the demise of both empires. He, unlike them, believed, and correctly so, as history revealed, that the survival of Austria-Hungary depended upon peace. Uh, he also was committed to reforming Austria-Hungary, reducing to a great extent the power of the Hungarians and making the Southern Slavs a third force within what was described at that point as a dual uh, monarchy. Uh, for this reason, his assassination was largely welcomed by, by Hungarians. So he had a different belief system and a different foreign policy uh, based on it. Now, you then have to ask yourself, uh, why was it that he was uh, unusual among the leaders, the only leader who felt strongly uh, that this was the case? And for that, um, you have to understand the extent to which um, Austro-Hungarian monarchy was a rule by aristocrats who placed enormous emphasis on honor and how the war party framed politics and their relationship with Serbia in terms of honor and believed that not drawing the sword was dishonorable and how the German blank check was motivated by a similar reason the Kaiser wrote in marginalia on the documents that he envisaged his role as a second to Franz Ferdinand in the duel with Serbia. So again, framing it as a matter of honor. Uh, Franz Ferdinand, on the other hand, framed the issue as one of security. And that led to a completely different set of guidelines and policies. However, uh, agency is limited in this instance because it's very clear that the leadership as a whole is embedded in a particular social structure with a set of values which it's enacting. So um, what I'm suggesting here is I'm trying to bring in the role of society through the reflections and decisions of actors. Uh, I'm not privileging actors over uh, um, society, but rather seeing actors, as I noted Max Weber said, uh, as the people who ultimately make decisions and are responsible for politics. And we have to understand their behavior. That doesn't mean that their behavior reflected free choices. 
Great, thank you so much for that. That was very helpful. And the last question I think goes to Eda. Thank you. Um, Professor, I was wondering if you thought falsification was uh, attainable or important for the utility of counterfactuals. Uh, and would the answer differ according to whether it's a false positivist or a positivist that's answering the question? What right. So I actually have a, a book about to come out on this subject with Cambridge called Reflections on International Relations Theory. And it looks at the, the contrast positivism and interpretivism, how they frame knowledge, how they think knowledge is attained, and this is what's relevant to your question, how we know we have it. And clearly for positivists, for many of them, falsification is the key to knowledge. Uh, there are all kinds of problems with trying to falsify something. And moreover, uh, there is a great disparity between the philosophy of science here with its emphasis on falsification and what scientists actually do. On the whole, scientists are more convinced by confirmation than falsification and are willing to stay with propositions that have been falsified for many productive reasons. So it turns out that it's a far more complicated issue and one on which I could give another lecture, but hard to offer you the succinct kind of uh, reply that I wish I could. Wonderful, well, we do hope to host you again. I mean, we, we will host you again uh, in November Yes, uh, uh, <laughs> which we're very much looking forward to. Um, but also we're hoping at some point you're going to enlighten us about um, your, your, your books about uh, falsification, positivism and interpretivism. Um, I don't believe there are at this point um, any questions from the students. Um, I would like to take the privilege of the, uh, of the, of the chair or whatever I am here to ask a question as well. Um, something that you said earlier um, really struck me and uh, I, I saw it in your, in your writings as well. And that was that if, um, if we had different victors in World War I, um, IR theory would have evolved very differently. Um, that implies that all of IR theory has, that, that matters comes from the West. Um, and I wonder whether the kinds of changes we have seen uh, in recent times where scholars are showing how um, the Global South has contributed to uh, IR theory, whether you would come to a different conclusion from, uh, from, from this perspective. I, I would still argue that, let's say, until the present, that IR theory has better or worse, been a creation of the West, and that social theories of all kind are based on our readings of history. And those who um, developed uh, realism and liberalism uh, did so in response to developments in the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, that said, um, I welcome the broadening of IR theory. It shouldn't be just a Western phenomenon. To the extent to which it describes the world, everybody in the world has an equal right to contribute and make it as such. And I hope that the extent to which uh, people are now educated around the world in IR theory will lead to the development of very different perspectives. Uh, what has often happened uh, is that Western perspectives have been imported back into the countries that people come from when they studied in the West uh, and they continue to thrive. Uh, what we need are indigenous theories of IR that then colonize the West. Uh, this, this process 
should go both ways. And when it does, and only when it does, will we have a really healthy profession. Thank you very much. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure that's going to give a lot of confidence and impetus to our students to come up with their theories. And I hope so. I, I wait and... to be enlightened. <laughs> um, so if there aren't any other questions. Well, uh, I think that's, that's it for now, because I need to uh, I need to go off. We have, you have been so very generous with your time. And I, I, I think I speak for everyone in uh, you know, in extending you an invitation in person at Bill Can for whenever you would like, well, you would like to, to very talk kind. about. It's very kind. This kind of session only uh, increases my desire to do this. Please do. Please do. We, we insist. Thank, thank you, Tudor. We, we will have a celebratory baklava when you know we, uh, I'm, I'm, the I'm COVID looking, will be over. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Thank okay, you so then. much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Have a good day. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Yes. Have a good you. evening.